lesson this morning comes from Luke 4, 1 through 13, the temptation of Jesus. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert where the, for the 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will be all yours. <clears throat> Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, It says, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all his tempting, he left until an appropriate, opportune time. The word of God. For the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Amen. How has this thing changed our lives? <laughs> cannot, I cannot remember. You, if you're watching old TV shows, you can tell almost exactly what year they were shot by this type of cell phones they have or don't have. Some movie they said, yeah, I'll probably be stopping every 15 minutes to use a pay phone to call home. Stop to call home? <laughs> We don't do that anymore. I understand those of, of you who are over 65, probably uh, only about 65% of you have cell phones, and you, many of you use them the same way you use CB radios back when, right? You turn them on when you leave town. Of course, out here, when you leave town, you drive out of the service area. They're not worth anything, but they're there. <laughs> For people my age, it's about 85% have cell phones and a good 60% have these smartphones. Now for people younger, it runs from, well, it's nearly 93% have cell phones and 59 to 65, 59 to 65% have smartphones. It's changing everything. Because this thing is not just a telephone, it just happens to be a telephone too, but it also can do a zillion things. Because this is a computer that is a z uh, about a thousand times more powerful than the big IBM computers back in the 60s. This thing is huge compared to those. And there's all these little programs, little applications, apps. No matter what you want to do, there is an app for that. What's great about the iPhone is that if you want to check snow conditions on the mountain, there's an app for that. If you want to check how many calories are in your lunch, there's an app for that. And if you want to check where exactly you parked the car, there's even an app for that. Yep, there's an app for just about anything. What do you know about song in the dancing of my eyes? I see you dancing, but you never ever mark your words. You ever so I can hear Stefan right now. I want that app. <laughs> Mom, can I have $2.99 to get that? That's the funny thing. Is there are so many phones out there, millions, like four million of them. You sell these little apps for about two or three bucks, and people get rich. Angry Birds has become a, a Billion dollar business at two and a half bucks, two or three bucks a pop. Of course, they keep coming out with new ones. <laughs> and got Star Wars birds now, and you know, it goes on and on. The important thing is that there's an app for that, whatever you want to do. There's one called Make a Habit, Break a Habit. And you use that if you've got things you'd rather not do in your life, you know, like smoking or whatever. 
And this app helps to helps you with behavior modification to get past those habits that you want to get rid of. But when it gets down to it, these apps are great for, for making us financially safe or, or as the Boy Scout motto is uh, physically strong, mentally awake, and here's the hard one, morally straight. The problem is we have temptations. We know up here what we want to do. We know down here we want to follow Christ. We want to be good people. We want to have a great life. But then comes temptation. Well, a social psychologist by the name of Walter Mitchell came up with the marshmallow test. Go ahead and roll. I'll talk over it. What he did was... He took kids, put them in a room by themselves, gave them one marshmallow. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you t another one, so then you'll have two. Temptation. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you to give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. Oh. <laughs> Temptation. It eats us alive. I mean, gets us. That's so cute. I love the kid who put it in his mouth and, oh my gosh! <laughs> Jesus faced some real temptations out there in the wilderness, 40 days without eating. He's hungry. Satan comes along and says, oh, you're hungry if you're the son of God. You can turn that stone, which is brown and round and probably has a shimmer from all the heat in the desert. Looks like a fresh baked loaf of bread. You just eat that because you can, it's, it, you're son of God, you can turn it into bread. Actually, being hungry is not a temptation. Actually, wanting food when you don't have any is not a temptation. The temptation is to want to use the power you have to solve a problem that really belongs to God. This is true for a lot of temptations we have. We try to use our own willpower, our own strength. And then we forget the most important part. A, a family was about... They're heading to church and they were running late and they decided they'd just stop at McDonald's and pick up some egg McMuffins on the way through the drive through As they went out of the car, their little daughter says, but you didn't feed us breakfast. And mom explained what they were going to do and dad says, you know, sweetheart, when have we ever let you go hungry? When have we ever refused to help you? To, to provide for your real needs. She goes, never. Well, that's the way it is with God. 
We just don't trust it. We miss a breakfast and suddenly we are hungry and metaphorically we want to do something about it. And Jesus says, no, you don't live by bread alone. You need bread, but you also need, and more importantly, every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In Luke's gospel, the second temptation, the devil takes him to a high place and looks out over all the nations of the world and says, you can rule these people and turn this world into the paradise you imagine. And Jesus is saying, cool. But, Satan says, you've got to worship me. And that's the catch, isn't it? If we just had enough power, we could turn everything around. If we just had enough, there's a lot of people in Washington, D.C. and the State House who, who are there to get enough power to do the things they think need to be done. Unfortunately, they never get enough power. Not really. I want to change the world to make it a better place. So I need power. I need, I need power in the, in the State House or in the Congress. I need power. And I need more power. And now I've got to protect my power. So I need more power. And soon you are worshiping the power itself. And you've forgotten what it was that you were going to do with it. But it isn't only that. Every single one of us has an ego. And that's good because the egos are what help us learn how to do things, how to survive, how to be, be uh, effective in the world. But then we start to think that the ego is me. All my past defines me, all the mistakes and all the triumphs. The future, my hopes and fears, they define me, but I don't exist in the past or the future. That's only illusion caused by the ego. Reverend Ed Bacon says the ego is Satan once we start to worship it. Once we start to get our worth from who we think we are. And Jesus said, you only serve, worship God. That's the question. Not the power. Not the love. And the third app is do not put God to the test. <coughs> Jump off of this roof, Jesus. Jump off of the water tower and God will send angels to lift you up so you won't stub your toe. We usually aren't real tempted to jump off of water towers. We just don't even think that we might be the son of God, son of God and so we don't really have to get God to prove it to us. But we do have ways that we test God. It might start in third grade when suddenly a pop quiz in the, on the multiplication tables comes up and you're not ready. So you say, oh dear God, let Marcy's paper become visible to me for just a short time and I will promise I won't cuss for a whole week. Then it gets a little better than that. Get a little older and says, just let me have some time alone with Robin Hit Hitman at the party tonight. And I promise, Lord, I will not yell at my sister for a whole week. Then we get a little older. Just let this pitch go across the plate and be the third strike. And Lord, I promise I won't drink all weekend. Or let those people come out of that conference room and tell me I got the job and Lord, I'll go to church for a, for a month of Sundays. What we're trying to do is bargain with God. I'm going to see if God will come at my beck and call because I want to be in control of God. I want to be in control of my own situation, produce bread. I want to be in control of others, rule the world. And I want to be in control of God. And make everything go the way I want it. And these are the temptations that drive us crazy. This program coming up on March 3rd is called God's at War. And it's about, temp about not temptation, but idolatry. Because... Every single person is 
from his mother's womb a master maker of idols. We make idols out of anything we want or desire or serve that's more than God. And it's hard. What do you do when you are faced with the issue of, of I love my family so I'm going to work overtime, but if I work overtime I can't be with my family. It's a hard one. How much X work and Y togetherness do we live? And I don't have an answer to that, but I do have a way to get past it, and that is to start praying to God. Because in the process of praying, you will lean in the right direction. You will lean toward God. You will lean in the direction of Jesus Christ. Keep in mind those apps. Serve only God, not self. Serve only God, not control. Serve only God. And don't expect God to, to answer a test. And probably a good idea to steer clear of marshmallows, right? <laughs> Ah. Uh -huh.